Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the time to watch my talk today. My name is Mike Bentley. I'm the Vice President of Training and Technical Services with the National Pest Management Association and uh, get the chance to talk to you today about some invasive species. Uh, bear with me just a second. We're going to go ahead and get this presentation started. So um, the title of my talk is the Top 5 Invasive Species. And I've got that in quotations because Top five could be a pretty subjective list. Um, so I'm going to give you my slant on what I think are five important invasive pests. But I think we're going to get the idea by the time we get there that there's a lot more invasive pests out there that we deal with. Um, but hopefully what we could take away from this is your role as a protector against some of these invasive pests. I mean, just how bad some of these things can be. Um, a little bit of a spoiler alert there about the five species that we're going to talk about. We do have one uh, surprise uh bonus species that we're going to talk about here as we get into it. But all right, so here's what I hope you get to take away from today's talk. Uh, we're going to start with talking a little bit about what exactly makes something an invasive species. We talk about invasive pests a lot, invasive animals and organisms a lot. Sometimes we say things like an alien species or an introduced species. And oftentimes I hear these terms used um, as if they're interchangeable, and a lot of times they're not. So we're going to talk a little bit about what each one of those definitions are. That's going to be admittedly kind of the boring part of this talk. Hopefully things get a little bit more exciting after that. Um, then we're going to talk about why these things are bad. When we talk about stuff in the context of an invasive species, um, why it's bad, why we don't want it around, and why your job is so important to control and manage these invasive pests. And then we're going to get into talking about my, again, air quotes here, top five uh, invasive pest species that you all should be aware of. Um, and then we're going to end with a, a little closing about what we can do to stop the unstoppable here. So let's get into it. Let's start with uh, the most boring part, and we'll get this out of the way, the definition of what exactly is an invasive species. Now, I know this is a, a, a snoozer of a slide, so bear with me here, but um, it is important to understand some of these definitions because when we're talking to our clients, when we're talking to our colleagues, we want to be exact in our terminology. So a couple things to review here briefly. Um, most importantly, a native species. That's something that is supposed to be there. It's historically or currently occurs in an ecosystem. Oftentimes we refer to something as an alien species, or you may have heard that before. I don't mean something like ET, though it could be. Uh, essentially, it is any non-native species in an ecosystem capable of propagating. That is, it, it, it has the ability to reproduce. So if we plop it down somewhere it's not supposed to be and it just dies off, it's not an alien species. But if we drop this ant species that's not supposed to be here in a country that it doesn't belong in, uh, and it suddenly can reproduce and start spreading, that would make it an alien species. Now, the term introduction is something we're gonna use quite a bit throughout this talk. So I do wanna go ahead and refresh everybody on what exactly that means. And that is the intentional or unintentional, which is a really important aspect here, escape or release of a species into an ecosystem as a result of human activity. Uh, so that's something we usually do, which we do a lot of, unfortunately, which is why we have this talk here. And then lastly, invasive species. All right, so that is an alien species, which again is the non-native species capable of reproducing, whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm. So to break this all down, the 101 version here is an invasive species is something that is capable of reproducing in an area it does not belong in, and it does or is capable of doing some level of harm. Um, and it's something that most oftentimes we have we have caused the introduction of and we'll talk about that here. So let's get into a little bit about why invasive species are bad um, and why it's so important for us to to manage them to the best of our abilities, which in some cases is pretty great. Some cases is not so great, as we'll see here soon. Uh, this is a cool diagram here that shows you the 10 most costly taxa from the most robust subset of original data, blah, blah, blah. Uh, boring big words there. Basically, these are like the 10 most economically and environmentally costly in terms of dollars, taxa and, and organisms that we deal with. And the thing to take away from here is eight out of those 10 are arthropods or mammals, structural pests, pests of importance and, med and, and medical importance, things that we may deal with on a regular basis, eight out of the 10. 
All right, so that's pretty impressive. So we're talking about the context of the importance of your role as a as a pest management perfection, professional and a protector of public health and structure and property and food. Um, eight out of the 10 most important taxa in the world in terms of the context of the, the range of, of damage they can do are those individuals and organisms that you deal with. So diving into this a little bit more, um, we're going to spend a couple slides here talking about just how vast that economic and environmental damage really can be. So focusing just on the U.S., we're going to talk about some stuff from a global perspective, but there's an estimated about 50,000 alien invasive species introduced in the U.S., um, uh, that have that have that have been introduced in the U.S. Now it's a combination of those terminology that we used earlier. So alien and invasive. So that's something that doesn't belong. Um, it's capable of reproducing and it is causing harm. Okay, so fifty thousand species that that have been introduced. Human mediated introduction, which is something we're going to be talking about. I estimate about twenty six point eight billion. That's billion with a B dollars each year. Uh, are in losses and damages as a result of these things. 26.8 billion, that's a huge number. 1.288 trillion dollars in total in estimated damages and losses as a result of these invasive pests from 1970 to 2017. So billion with a B and trillion with a T. Um, now, I think that, you know, in in today's era of, of we've got you know, millionaires and billionaires, that it's easy for us to lose context of just how big these numbers are. I have never seen a billion of anything in my life. Most people probably have not seen a billion of anything in reality um, in their entire lives. So it, it helps to kind of put this in context. So we talk about millions and billions. If I were to uh, give you, um, if you were to pay out or get paid $1 every second, it would take you 11 Seven and a half days to reach a million dollars. Now, if you were paid one dollar every second, it would take you three thirty one point seven years to generate a billion dollars, and thirty one thousand seven hundred nine years to generate a trillion dollars. So that is an insanely large number. So when we're talking about billions of dollars and trillions of dollars in damages. That is an incredibly, incredibly large amount. Uh, and it's estimated that about 42% of the species in the U.S. on the threatened or endangered species list are at risk primarily because of invasive species. So we talk about habitat loss and those sorts of things as being major factors that impact um, the success of some of these threatened or endangered species. But almost half of all of those species in the U.S. that are threatened or endangered are at risk primarily because of those invasive species. And as many as 80% of endangered species globally are threatened and at risk due to the pressure of non-native species. And we can see here just how so, what some of these impacts can look like. You've got uh, the, the waterway here. I believe this photo is from Missouri, if I'm not mistaken, of the carp that we've got. I'm going to turn on my uh, digital laser pointer here. So you can see all of these uh, carp invasive fish species that are completely overrunning this waterway. They're competing for food and resources with all those native fish species that are in there. Um, they're also competing for reproductive sites, um, all sorts of different things. All of these resources are now limited for those native species that are there. Then, of course, we see this, this uh, pretty horrible image here of this ground nesting bird species on an island ecosystem. And this is a, a yellow crazy ant species that they've completely overrun an area and in areas where you have damaging invasive ant species, specifically stuff like the yellow crazy ant, some other ant species we're going to talk about here shortly. Um, when those numbers get reached plague-like proportions, such as what we see here with the yellow crazy ant, they can do some pretty horrific damage to uh, native, native wildlife and native species. So ground nesting birds can easily be impacted. They just get simply overrun. Uh, the fledglings, those, those young birds in the nest, um, they lose their eyesight, all sorts of bad things from these ants. Lizards, all, all sorts of things are impacted by these. So pretty, pretty horrific stuff whenever we talk about the threats that they, they pose and, um, from environmental and economic impacts. So 
they are bad. Invasive species are bad, but are all introduced species bad? Now, this is where we're kind of flipping up that terminology a little bit. So this isn't intended to be a trick question, but more of an exercise in making sure that we're paying attention to the vocabulary we're using here. So invasive species, by definition, are things that do bad stuff, right? Um, are all introduced species bad? Well, believe it or not, we've got a number of introduced species in the U.S. and around the world that are not necessarily bad. They are introduced. We bring them in for a reason and we call them introduced because they do good things, right? They don't cause that economic or environmental harm. In fact, introduced species account for about 99% of all U.S. food system, the food uh, in, in the U.S. food system. Uh, so pretty incredible. We do rely on bringing in some things that don't belong here. Um, but those things are carefully cultivated or managed in a way in which uh, we eliminate their the harm that they potentially could do. Um, so, and most of that lies in agriculture, things like the, and the produce and stuff. And, um, you know, on the ag side, we've got cattle and, and, and chickens and those sorts of things. So um, not all introduced species are bad, but all of those uh, invasive pests are certainly bad. So we do need some of those introduced species. So how do these invasive species make it around? Well, uh, to no surprise, I'm sure uh, you've probably guessed by now that we are the culprits, all right? So we are most oftentimes, now there are there are situations and events where um, weather systems and, and you know, even there's, there's a term called phresis where insects and arthropods can actually hitch rides on organisms and be transported from one location to another. There are naturally occurring mechanisms that allow um, a species to cross a land bridge or do some sort of thing to, to find its way into an area where it doesn't may not belong, and then it could potentially become an invasive beyond just an introduced species. Um, but more often than not, it's human-mediated transportation is the culprit. And this is a graphic here that shows you, this is just a, a visual illustration of the amount of shipping lanes that occur within uh, around the world. So um, this is just ships. This does not cover airport. This is our air airlines and the amount of uh, planes that are flying around all the time. We are we have grown incredibly effective at, at transporting ourselves around the world and the things that we like to bring with us and ship, um, import and export. And unfortunately, us and all the things that we bring with us oftentimes have these unwanted pests and these hitchhikers. Uh, that can very easily find their way onto um, our ships and in our goods, and we transport them around. A great example of that, uh, a pest that we're going to be talking about here pretty shortly, uh, spotted lanternfly. Uh, we've got, um, you know, a few hornet species that uh, have, have shown up uh, that don't belong here in the United States and in North America that have found their way across. Um, some of those have been attributed to transportation of landscape goods or shipping containers, those sorts of things. So oftentimes, uh, shipping lanes, human mediated transport, certainly an important mechanism for uh, transportation. Now, we're mostly going to be focusing on structural pests here, but um, it's it's kind of a unique uh, thing that we don't really often think about. You know, I talk about ships being such an effective mechanism for transporting invasive species, even the water that they pick up from one ocean. Um, so in order for these ships to carry such a large load, these giant barges, they have these huge ballast tanks and these tanks have to be filled with water. It helps them to sit lower into the ocean uh, to allow them to have more stability so they can carry these larger loads to, to manage these large cargo holds. And what can happen is these ships will pick up this uh, and take in hundreds of you know thousands of gallons of water into those ballast tanks at ocean A and then travel halfway around the world and then spit out all that water in ocean B and they're inadvertently transporting all these organisms, microorganisms, mollusks, all sorts of things uh, from one ocean to another. Um, and oftentimes we've we found that, you know, things like zebra mollusks is a great example of this, a horribly damaging invasive species um, that was inadvertently transported thanks to ballast tanks and ships. So um, every aspect from, you know, from the water to the cargo could potentially hold uh, some pretty nasty stuff that uh, that ultimately ends up becoming potentially becoming an invasive species. 
Um, and like I said, uh, it's not just the, the folks that are on those ships, but the goods that we transport on those ships can often be a problem. Uh, we love to transport around these exotic plants. Um, so oftentimes we bring in plants, which we'll talk about the, the role that those play in transporting and introducing a number of invasive pests. Um, but the used tire trade is another one that is as a really important culprit of, of transporting a number of mosquito species and allowing some mosquito species to spread uh, from Asia to, to other parts of the world and here in the United States. Um, uh, that, you know, there's a number of container breeding mosquito species lay their eggs inside these, these tires and those tires get transported over um, or vice versa. And then those mosquitoes hatch and come out. So all sorts of really bad stuff uh, and, you know, inadvertently transporting some of these pests around. Yeah, you know, so it's not just human mediated transport uh, that allows for invasive species or species to be spread and become invasive, um, but it's also the world around us. Uh, it's it's uh, th there's no denying the fact that uh, the world is warming. This is a really cool graphic here. Um, regardless of, of why it's warming or how long it's been warming, uh, we've got some hard scientific evidence that that shows and confirms here um, that we do. Uh, that we are seeing a measurable increase in our average low temperatures um, here in the United States and across North America. Um, so this is a really cool study that was done, a paper that was published in 2018. And the purpose of this paper was to determine and uh, show the potential range expansion of disease spreading ticks. Um, because the, the greater their range and the, the more that they expand and the, the more those populations can expand out, with the expansion of that range means more people are being are potentially at risk of exposure to those populations of disease spreading ticks, which means a greater population is at risk of potentially contracting the diseases those ticks are responsible in spreading. And uh, from that paper, they had this really amazing graphic that shows in part A here, uh, cell A, you could see from 1970, the darker the color blue, the colder it was. And then if we jump over to figure B here, uh, 2016, we can see just how much less of that dark blue. And that dark blue represents the average low temperatures um, in uh, January. So the average lows. And what we're seeing here is that the average low temperatures have increased, which means that that cold barrier uh, that used to afford a lot of those northern states across the border of north, uh, the northern border of the United States and into Canada, um, they they were offered a, a, a large level of protection from a number of tropical and and uh, um, and, and Mediterranean climate um, uh, insects and arthropods and other mammals that may not be as cold tolerant or cold hardy. Well, what we're seeing now is over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, those average lows are increasing. So what that means is a larger proportion of the United States is warm enough for a number of these potentially damaging invasive pests uh, to be able to expand their range much further north. The more they expand the range, the greater the population is at risk of damage from whatever the mechanisms are of damage that those, those invasive species spread. So that could be you know, native, native plants and organisms in the ecosystem, that could be people, that could be food, um, a number of different things. So um, why are these invasive species spreading? human mediated transport is certainly important, but our, our world is warming around us right now, and that's creating a, a wider range uh, for these organisms to live. Now, once they do find their way into an area, Oftentimes, one of the problems that we face that's not particularly a problem for these introduced organisms is that they have escaped from natural predators. So when they're in their native ecosystem, uh, they've got other things that they typically compete for with resources. Um, they've got stuff that they're fighting for 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 uh, space to, to live, and there's other things that are constantly trying to eat them. Well, when you plop them down into an area that they've never been before, um, there probably are no uh, natural predators and there are no other natural competitors for a lot of these resources. So because of that, the reproduction rate can skyrocket, which a lot of times will often result in uh, population growth that can expand exponentially. So we're looking at the picture here on the right, we can see all that brown coffee ground stuff that is actually dead ants piled up alongside of a structure. Hundreds of thousands of dead ants, in fact, um, from an invasive ant species in southeastern United States 
um, that was introduced, um, unintentionally introduced, and uh, had the populations can reach plague-like proportions in certain areas. So you can see here just from escape from natural predators and a couple other factors allowing these populations to expand exponentially. So uh, what do we do about these things? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about our, our efforts for control, but there are some really important stop gaps in place, some mechanisms that do exist currently to help us control this. And while there are invasive species that we're going to talk about that have just run rampant, and elimination is probably no longer an option for a number of these things, um, I do think it is important while we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the doom and gloom of some of these bad things, that we do have some amazing protections and mechanisms for control in place. And without these, the problems would be exponentially worse, right? It is fantastic that we've got things like the USDA and uh, these, uh, yeah, these checkpoints in place, um, systems for uh, constant monitoring and evaluation for importation, exportation of goods, treating things at shipping ports, uh, we have all sorts of great tools in use, fumigation stations, those sorts of things where there's requirements in place before something comes into the United States or before it leaves the United States at any one of these shipping ports or importation, exportation locations. It's got to go through a number of things. So because of those mechanisms, we do have a great level of pre prevention in place. Despite that, however, uh, we do still see that some of these things can make it through. Um, so We've got uh, excellent levels of protection there in terms of prevention. There's some really cool tools that are out um, that and, you know, science is constantly evolving. Uh, there are tools that are in place right now, uh, things like eDNA surveillance. So eDNA surveillance um, is it's referent it's it's referring to in the east the small e stands for environmental. So it's environmental DNA surveillance. And that's where they can take uh, biologists can take water samples or they can collect soil and they can evaluate those samples. And, and if there is any DNA matter, let's say from defecation or just simply from a fish swimming in ballast water, they can take samples of that water and evaluate that and run a DNA surveillance toolkit uh, and analyze that water to see um, if there are, if there is DNA present from things that should not be there. So there's some really cool eDNA uh, toolkits that we're just starting to scratch the surface of. Um, predictive modeling certainly is one. Uh, we see that quite a bit with some of the invasive species that we're talking about, things like the red imported fire ant, one that we're really not going to mention today. Um, there's been some really extensive modeling to show the, pr the predictive range expansion. That the, the model that we saw earlier, that graphic showing the average lows increasing, that was tied into predictive modeling features um, that were used to project the potential range expansion for those ticks that we were talking about. So predictive modeling is also very important because ultimately knowing where these things could go and being ready for them to be there is one of the most important keys. So that is that is in terms of prevention. Uh, making sure that you are prepared for these things before they get there rather than being reactive to them. So being proactive is certainly important. And a key to that is education. So education, knowing what it is that we're dealing with, where it could be, thanks to the tools that we have, like early detection, those prevention mechanisms, educating those folks in those areas that may not already have those invasive species. Um, so they are more adequately prepared to, one, be able to identify them, Two, be able to respond once they are detected. Um, and three, know how to put, put, put into place effective control measures um, if and when quarantine procedures need to be enacted. So education, like what we're doing right now, we're going to talk about being able to identify some of these things today and what you need to do to respond to them. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, it would it would be uh, yeah, a miss not to mention that we do have immediate control res responses in place. And there are a number of those. But one of those is you, you know, as the pest management professionals, you are a frontline defender. You know, we talk about protecting against uh, public health pests and disease and those sorts of things. Um, but invasive species is one that, you know, we, we, we deal with on a pretty regular basis, but I don't think it gets mentioned quite, quite enough. Um, so when we're dealing with the potential introduction or the inevitable introduction of new invasive species, which every year, you know, you never know when that new invasive is going to show up in your area, um, pest management professionals are oftentimes the first folks to identify or call out something unique in their area that they have not noticed before. And we'll talk about the importance of that shortly. So, okay. So we've covered 
what an invasive species is, why they're bad, why we need to cover them. So let's talk about a, a handful of these pests here. So I've got here my five, my top five-ish invasive species that are impacting the Midwestern region. Now, again, it's really hard to, to sit here and nail down what the five most important pests are. They're all pretty bad, all right? Um, there's a number of them, and I can pick different categories and give you a top five list for each one of those categories. I'm just going to, I picked five here that we're going to talk about that I think are incredibly important. Some of them more important than others, some newer than others. And then we're going to end with a new, a relatively new invasive pest in your region um, that I think everybody needs to be aware of uh, and uh, hopefully give you some tools to, to be prepared and equipped for handling this pest uh, if and when you ever come across it. All right, so let's get started. So we're going to start uh, with um, uh, probably a familiar foe for a number of you out there, and that is the Argentine ant. So um, for, for those of you that don't know, the Argentine ant is invasive. It is not native to the United States. It originally came from South America. It's what we refer to as a tramp ant species. So um, it's a species that's easily spread and transported uh, around, around, the, around the world. Um, it does tend to prefer more of a Mediterranean climate, which tends to be a cooler, uh, um, uh, more humid uh, environment. Not, not that typical, very hot, very humid, tropical, subtropical climate like what we think of with a lot of our other typical uh, tropical invasive ant species. But it is one of the world's most widespread invasive ant species. And in terms of in the context of its environmental damage, um, it's pretty bad. So these populations can reach, you know, incredibly high numbers, super colony size numbers that completely overwhelm and wipe out um, native and important species. We can see a picture here that you're seeing on the screen. There's a number of these Argentine ants attacking a really important uh, native harvester ant species. So these harvester ants, uh, there are a number of plant species out there that rely on these harvester ants for seed dispersal. These Argentine ants are just uh, bullying this much bigger ant and their strength in numbers. They completely overwhelm it, they kill the ant, um, and then they can take and capitalize on all those resources. Now, it likely made its way into the United States through infested uh, landscape materials, which tends to be pretty much the number one uh, mechanism of transportation and introduction in the United States and around the world for, for almost any invasive ant species you're talking about. Like I said, we love to pick up and, and transport these tropical and subtropical plants. We put them in big containers full of soil. We keep them very moist. That is the ideal conditions for a lot of these ant species. Um, so oftentimes we inadvertently end up picking up a small nest cell, a small micro colony that may have a reproductive and some workers and some eggs and some larvae in there. And then we transport that small nest cell somewhere and then that population explodes. Um, now I mentioned that they can create super colonies that can outcompete native ant species and it makes them incredibly important in urban environments. Um, so identifying these ants is relatively easy. They're pretty small, two to three millimeters in length. They're monomorphic. So monomorphic is one of those nerdy specific ant terms that's referring to the different size of workers. In this case, monomorphic meaning same size. So those workers tend to be about the same size, two to three millimeters. They're light brown. Now I will say that this image here, uh, it look, may be a little bit doctored in terms of color. So it makes it look a little lighter brown than they actually are, but they're, they tend to be lighter brown than most ant species. 12 segmented antenna. Um, that's a tough one to have to count those antenna. So it's important to know how many antenna segments there are, but that's a really hard key to use. Um, one of the things to, to identify them with is they've got a single nose. When we talk about ant species and identifying ants, it's really important to know where that node is and how to count and differentiate those nodes. We're always talking about nodes and with ants where either one node ants or two node ants. This is a one node ant, and not only does it only have one node, but it's clearly visible from up top. A similar looking species is the odorous house ant, about the same size, maybe a little bit bigger than Argentine ants, but its node is not easily visible like, like it is for the Argentina here. So quick and easy to find in character for them. Um, they're pretty well distributed throughout the United States. Uh, this, this map is pretty cool. This is from antmaps.org. Um, and essentially it relies heavily on citizen science as well as other confirmed identification um, metrics from uh, land grant universities and, and all sorts of different organizations, as well as individuals being able to report. Um, but what's cool about it is it shows you what it, it helps to define those introduction in the in the uh, the metrics for how those individuals are infesting an area. And what I want to point out here is that indoor introduction 
um, is what we kind of see with these lighter red or lighter brownish, depending on the color of your monitor, um, for these states up here. So the states that we're mostly focused on right here, that lighter red, indoor introductions. Um, and I'll follow that with uh, this, um, this slide here that talks a little bit about uh, breaking down what their introductions look like and how there's a really cool publication that came out in 2016 does a great job of defining and talking through um, all the different exotic ant species that are in Ohio. Um, and they've got a section there that talks about the Argentine ant. And uh, in, in their characteristics of defining those introductions, they talk about the, the counties where they're confirmed. You can see all the different locations here. Um, very high worker densities observed suggest that the species now is well-established indoor colonies in this site. All right. So well-established in Ohio. We've got, you know, in this area, well-established in the area. At present, the species can survive in the north only in heated buildings, right? So when we're talking about structures, heated buildings, that's homes, right? So um, what we'll see, though, is when it's warmer out, those populations can expand, which is what we're going to talk about right now. Um, so in terms of biology and control for these pests, uh, they're polygynous and polydomous, all right? Two more kind of nerdy specific ant terms. We'll, we'll talk about these a little bit later down the road. Uh, but polygynous just means they've got a, multiple queens, so multiple reproductives, and multiple nest sites, all right? So, and that basically boils down to this. They've got a lot more reproductives and a lot more nest sites. So not like a red imported fire ant where you have that maybe a one mound, um, it's not a colony that, that is singularly located in one place with one reproductive. They can have hundreds or thousands of reproductives and hundreds or thousands of nest sites. All right. So think about that like um, truck stops. The more rest stops and fueling stations they have, the more effective and efficient they are at bringing resources back to the colony, keeping the overall colony alive. So all that translates to higher reproductive rates, much larger colonies. Some, so and that means those, those colony numbers can get up there really quickly, particularly in those warmer times of year. They have very adaptable nesting habits and they can relocate quickly. So what, what that means is that if you're not treating for these ants correctly, meaning that you're using ant specific products, so ant specific stuff means something that's a, typically a non-repellent and it's slow acting. Um, things like a bait or a contact active ingredient. These contact uh, products um, and these baits that are designed for ants generally are designed to allow those ants to survive after exposure or ingestion for three to five days, maybe even more. Right? That gives those ants time to consume or contact that active ingredient and then share that with other nest mates ultimately hoping to get that active ingredient back to kind of like spreading the flu, spreading that, that, that active ingredient back to those reproductives and then wiping out those reproductives. Um, in terms of, uh, and so, sorry to, to go back to this. So if you're, if you're not using an ant specific product because they're so quick to relocate their nests, let's say you come in, you, you missed the fact that these ants were on property and you're using a highly repellent product with a very fast knockdown rate, um, you could actually start pushing those ants to other areas. Uh, they can quickly relocate, pick up those small nest sites, move those nest sites to another area. And all you're actually doing is pushing the problem around or spreading that problem across the property, or even in some cases, pushing it indoors um, as those reproductives are, are escaping that treatment. So it's really important to make sure that you do that adequate inspection, you know what you're dealing with. Now outdoors, they tend to like these really high humidity environments, um, soil, things like plants, landscape items. That's going to be really important, those landscape items. We'll talk, talk about that here in a second. Then indoors, again, plants and other high moisture locations. So we talked about in these areas like in Indiana and in, in Ohio, where um, you know in the summertime, it's beautiful. It's nice. Everybody's got plants and everything outside. It starts to get cold. So you bring those tropical, subtropical plants inside the house. And suddenly those plants that may have had that nest of ants inside that pot are now being brought inside the home where they can quickly relocate to wall voids in other areas where there could be a uh, moisture leak and those other things. So important to kind of keep an eye on those and uh, kind of understand the context of the impacts those could have. Now, in terms of control for the species, <coughs> excuse me, um, source reduction is going to be the most important thing, All right, Making sure that we're managing landscape on the outside 
um, not allowing for, uh, you know, uh, overgrown landscape and vegetation, making sure all that stuff's carefully managed because overgrown vegetation just creates more environment for them. <laughs> Excuse me. And then potted plants um, on the inside, making sure that plants are not overly watered and inspecting those potted plants very carefully before bringing them inside. We already talked about this, those baits and non-repellents are going to certainly be key in control. Uh, but then being aware that this species is seasonally polydomous. So we talked about earlier polydomy being where they can have multiple nest sites. So just quickly to kind of run through this, seasonal polydomy is where in the wintertime you have maybe a single nest site, but as it warms up in the spring and summer, the number of those nest sites represented by these circles here um, increases, and then it starts to drop back down in the fall and the wintertime. <clears throat> well, when it comes to control, the hope is that we try to control these ants earlier on whenever we may only have a few nest sites and effectively controlling those nests early on means that by wiping out a number of those nest sites earlier in the spring, you're only dealing with a smaller number of peak nest sites in the summertime. So they never really reach those plague-like numbers. So kind of looking at another way, if we look at this linear, uh, this, this line here representing the increase and decrease of ant populations over time, um, in terms of timing our management, and this can be the case for any ant species, really trying to time that, ma that management early in the spring before those populations ramp up. Thinking about that red line there as being kind of that critical threshold, managing those numbers and managing those colonies before those uh, numbers really start to ramp up can uh, have huge impacts down the road on how effective your total control solutions are um, in the summertime. Because once those populations start to reach those high numbers, you're never going to be able to get control of them. At that point, it's just, it's simply being reactive instead of proactive. So understanding that seasonal polydomy for the species is really important. Trying to put those control measures in place early on in the springtime before those populations have a, have a chance to, to really explode. All right. So uh, the, the next couple species, we're not going to spend quite as much time on. Um, this is one, the Asian longhorn tick. Uh, this is one that I think is incredibly important, even though it may not be as impactful as a structural pest um, as some of the other ones may be, but it is still potentially an incredibly impactful invasive pest that you and your role may come across. Um, and certainly your clients may have some concerns about. So it's important to understand here. So the Asian longhorn tick uh, originally came from East Asia. It was first reported in New Jersey in 2017. Uh, they believe the introductions may have occurred as early back as around 2010 or maybe even earlier. It's unknown how it was actually first introduced. They believe it was probably brought in through the importation of pets or livestock. This particular tick is mostly an agricultural pest. Um, so that is, it, it spreads disease to cattle, um, it's very problematic from a, a, a livestock management perspective, but it will feed on humans and pets as well as some other wildlife. So um, they appear to be less attractive to people um, and the, the overall disease vector potential in the U.S. is still unknown. So even though this thing's been around since about 2010 to 2017, we still don't fully understand the vector potential of this tick yet. Um, just because it is a tick, though, does not make it an adequate vector of all tick-borne diseases. A lot of these diseases tend to be species-specific. Um, so we know that it's an effective vector of some diseases to cattle, um, but it hasn't been shown to effectively vector any of these any of these uh, bacteria, virus, viruses, and pathogens um, over to humans yet. <clears throat> now, identifying this tick is a challenge, um, and, and mainly because it looks pretty similar to the brown dog tick, with the exception that it's it's a much smaller tick overall. Um, but in order to really identify it, you need a very, very, very good microscope, some really good eyes. Um, and you need to look at the mouth parts. So we're looking at the mouth parts here. Um, and this is a great diagram that shows you uh, the angular feature of the second segment of the palps. I know this gets really granular here. So we're looking at the red arrow, this pointed feature here. So this, this here, this image, this is of the Asian longhorn tick. This here is of the brown dog tick. So we're looking at comparing these features here on the brown dog tick these features here on the Asian longhorn tick. And we can see that first red arrow points to how pointed this feature is. So we can kind of see that here in this actual image, really, really, really pointed um, and kind of swooping out 
of this, um, the second segment of the palps here. Um, we can see here, not quite as pointed in this illustration, not quite as pointed in this kind of granular image here that we've got of the brown dog tick. Um, the, the really defining character though, uh, but again, this one is tough to see, even with a good microscope, is that spur on the third segment. So this is a very, very, very tip of these palps. There's no way you're seeing this with the naked eye. You're going to have to have a really good microscope. Um, it's got this little tiny spur on it, whereas you don't have that at all on the brown dog tick. So, um, but they can look really similar to the brown dog tick. Now they're spreading pretty quickly. So 19 states and counting, it has been confirmed. Um, and uh, recently this year, it was confirmed and found in Indiana. So it is in the area. And here's what's concerning about these ticks. Aside from their potential of uh, the unknown disease of uh, vectoring potential, they can reproduce parthenogenically, which means they don't need a mate to reproduce. You can see here this image of this little tiny tick that's a full grown adult there on somebody's index fingernail. They don't need a mate to reproduce. So these individuals uh, will likely continue to spread in areas where they can still survive. They don't need a mate to reproduce. So the numbers uh, can be pretty concerning in areas. So one to certainly watch out for. <clears throat> um, and this is going to be probably the most important slide. We're going to have a couple of these that show up here. What do you do if you find something you think could be this invasive tick or any invasive species? Drop it in some rubbing alcohol, put it into a Ziploc bag, contact your local state agriculture department or local uh, agricultural extension office and bring it to them. That's the most important thing you could do. It's easy to misidentify them. It's easy to assume they are something else. So if you see something, you're not sure what it is, looks maybe like a really small brown dog tick, but you're not sure, bring it to your local authority. They're going to be able to help you out. All right, so the next uh, invasive pest, I'm just lumping them all together and just saying commensal rodents. In terms of importance and damage and risk and all that other stuff, commensal rodents are, are, are hands down for me, number one, all right? So when we talk about commensal rodents, we're talking about those rodents that, that live and breed inside of our homes, have an intimate relationship with us. That's the Norway rat, the roof rat, and the house mouse. Uh, just quickly, quickly bouncing through these because I know that this is um, a pest group that you have probably heard of quite a bit. So we're not going to spend a ton of time on this, but just understanding here, globally, they are a, a major issue. $30 billion annually in food losses. Uh, globally in the U.S., about $19 billion in costs associated with rat infestations, damages, and control. Um, from a surface contamination standpoint, absolutely horrific. They're, they're implicated in a large number of foodborne uh, illnesses, diseases, respiratory issues. Um, a lot of that has to do with their defecation rate. You know, we talk a lot of times about, uh, throw a quick figure in here for you. Um, people say, oh, you know, uh, rats and mice can defecate, you know, insert the number here times a day. Uh, well, it, you know, it, it, it can vary. It can vary from mouse to mouse, from rat to rat, the individual, their diet, their health, just like humans. There are There is not an average number that meets every single human. The same thing there wouldn't be for rodents. A more accurate representation of that is about the weight, the total weight that they would, they would defecate in a day. Um, and for mice, it's an average of about 0.25 to 1 grams per day, about 1% of their body weight, which is quite impressive. So they defecate a lot, and that's because there's a lot of communication mechanisms that are associated with that defecation. There's pheromones and all sorts of things that they use in their urine and their, in their feces to let other rodents know what's going on and communicate potentially safe harbor and those sorts of things. The problem is, uh, particularly in mice, that defecation, both rats and mice, they can have bacteria, pathogens, but in mice specifically, they also can have this MUS-M1 protein, which is a urinary protein that is implicated in respiratory illness and disease, particularly in the extremely young and the extremely old. Uh, so <clears throat> it can be uh, an incredible uh, health concern in addition to uh, the foodborne illnesses and everything else. So respiratory issues in addition to all those problems. Um, and, you know, we talked about food loss and damages annually and globally. Just throw one figure in there to kind of help you gain the perspective of just how uh, huge some of these losses are. Rodents essentially uh, estimated damaging about 20% of the world's food supply. The pre-harvest losses alone in Asia range from 5% range from to 17% in Indonesia. 6% um, of those pre-harvest losses represent enough rice to feed the population of Brazil for an entire year. 
So when we're talking about losing 20% of the world's food supply, that is an insane number. And just pre-harvest losses alone, 6% of those pre-harvest losses could feed the entire population of Brazil for a year. That's crazy. So, so commensal rodents are, are certainly a problem, certainly a concern, um, you know, in terms of distribution and range, uh, you know, rats and mice found pretty much unanimously across the United States. Roof rats are the one exception, tend to be more coastally located, um, or they're going to be in areas where you have the shipping ports. They tend to be uh, more closely um, located in areas closer to water. Uh, but control for rodents is going to be a multimodal approach, right? That's where we have this multi-step program. It's integrated uh, rodent management strategy where we've got inspection, sanitation, exclusion, mechanical control, as well as uh, chemical control with rodenticides and other important control tools. So it's going to take this multi-step approach, but incredibly important to know the, uh, the, the potential impact that these that these have. So now we're going to shift gears completely and go to uh, the multicolored Asian lady beetle. Now, this one is a, from our homeowner's perspective. This is certainly one that is on the top of the list for a lot of folks uh, that may or may not see it as a problem until it becomes a problem in their home. Does it spread disease? No. Does it damage our homes? Not necessarily. But is it a structural pest and can it cause problems? Absolutely. Um, and it is an invasive pest because of that. Now, this one's kind of unique. I um, mean, it is one of our invasive pests that we brought over and we did that for a good reason and we had good intentions. And unfortunately, those intentions went awry. Um, so it originated in Asia. Uh, it came in uh, first released around 1916 because these uh, uh, lady beetles <clears throat> have a voracious appetite for a lot of damaging pest insects um, that, that uh, feed and damage uh, crops. So brought over as a biological control for a number of these things. Unfortunately, uh, this specific species uh, has a propensity to, when temperatures start to drop, aggregate in, ver in potentially very large numbers and look for areas where um, they can aggregate and oftentimes inside structures to survive the winter months. So and we often call them as overwintering pests. They also have the ability to uh, do what's called reflex bleeding, which is when they're agitated, they can squirt out this uh, yellow juice that can be uh, not smell very good and uh, it can agitate, can also stain. Uh, so a whole number of problems. Now, in terms of identifying them, uh, you know, as immatures, they look like these uh, these larvae. They look like these completely alien creatures. Uh, here's an individual pupating in here, and here's the adult. And there's a lot of misnomers about how many spots they have, all those different things, and that's how you identify these and different spots being different things. These are just variations of the same species. Ultimately, to identify the multicolored Asian lady beetle, um, what you're looking for is this characteristic um, pattern here on uh, that shield there. So if we look at these uh, individuals over here, we can see different colored spotting patterns and different variations, but we can very easily see that black M on all of these locations here, despite that, uh, that spot variation. So that's what we're looking for on these. Um, in terms of control, you know, it's going to be uh, mechanical control is going to be your most important. We've got some, some holes here chewed in from probably some squirrels in a soffit. We've got an area on an exterior shed, uh, which is where this follow-up picture was taken. This is actually my shed. This is uh, inside of my shed uh, a week ago. Um, so this is some exclusion work that has to be done uh, to, to seal this area up where these individuals are getting in. Um, but it can be any small crack or crevice. We've got a, a an office door here where you can clearly see light coming through. That hole is more than big enough. Temperatures are starting to drop across the country right now. Usually around September time is when we start to see these individuals looking for and seeking shelter. So prime time to uh, start looking for those areas to, to start to exclude, making sure that those, those uh, holes are properly sealed and thinking long-term too. Don't just seal these holes and cracks and crevices up just to, to take it uh, to correct issues with these um, uh, overwintering pests. And you got holes like this, make sure you're using mesh small enough that these individuals can't get through, but you're using the right materials also so rodents and other pests can't get in as well. Things like spray foam or uh, expanding foam, not a good solution. All right, second to last here is going to be the spotted lantern fly. Now, this one uh, is particularly important. Now, again, this is one that 
Um, you know, especially when it first was introduced, wasn't really considered much of a structural pest uh, because of the fact that it's mostly cons- it's it's mostly an agricultural pest. All right, so the impacts for these individuals, um, it's native to China. It is a beautiful insect. Uh, from an entomological perspective, these things look really, really cool. They're really beautiful. They're nice and big. Um, but unfortunately, they can do some major feeding damage on a number of fruit, ornamental, and wooded trees. Um, so it makes them a huge concern uh, from homeowners' perspective. They can potentially do damage to trees and things inside the yard. But from an agricultural perspective, these larger orchards and things like that, um, certainly a pest of very high importance. Um there are areas across the country where quarantine procedures are in place for these or, uh, these individuals. Um, you can see here, most oftentimes, the way that they are transported around um, is you may have a situation in which, depending on the time of year, we could see that life cycle here with the timing. Um, they You may have incidentally, accidentally transport early nymphs. But more often than not, it's the egg masses that are actually transported around. That's when folks may be moving around. Once again, we're talking about uh, you know potted plants and these tropical plants, those sorts of things, um, moving these things around from time to time. <clears throat> um, but when you do and they cross state lines, very easy to pick up a plant that may have something on here. You know, imagine the underside of a branch or something higher up, harder to see. But these egg masses start to show up around September time um, and they can and, and the range goes through June because you can easily have adults that, that finish out their life cycle um, and then lay those egg masses again um, before those egg masses overwinter. Uh, but you start to see those uh, first instars hatching around April time. We start to see a little bit more color show up around July in the summer. Then, of course, these adults show up in um, uh, mid to late July um, and then that's whenever they're going to be reproducing and uh, mating and then looking to lay those egg mass to overwinter. Um, so really depending on the time of year, it's really important from a PMP's perspective to know what you're looking for and to be on the lookout for them. So we've got an image here we could see, you know, they do a pretty good job of blending into some of these trees. We could see some egg masses here that look kind of just like a little bit of, you know, uh, of concrete, some slag, uh, not very easy to see. Um, I will say from a control perspective though, um, you know, a direct topical application of the adults and the nymphs can typically take care of things, making sure, of course, you're using a product that is properly labeled and you're applying to an area and following label instruction um, and applying to areas that your license dictates. Because these individuals could potentially be on ornamentals and things farther away from the home, being cognizant and aware of what your limitations are in your state with your license for what you can and cannot apply to. But <clears throat> mechanical control is pretty solid and pretty effective because of the fact that these things are regularly transported around as egg masses, simply scraping these egg masses off can be a pretty effective control tool. So, uh, you know, being, being on the lookout, knowing that if you're in an area, which you can see here, the distribution range, um, knowing where these individuals are and as they're spreading, I'm currently in Virginia, they've been creeping their way down through and uh, this year, we're, we've seen them in areas that we have not seen them before. So their range is already spreading well throughout Virginia in areas that um, we didn't see them previously. Uh, if you do see a sighting, you should report it. Even if it's an area where it has already been confirmed, it is still valuable information to share. I've got the really long URL here. Um, I also encourage you, there is a QR code that will take you. Uh, to the area. So please go ahead and take a picture of that. Um, have this uh, website saved. Um, if you're in an area that or you're in a county that's not currently highlighted blue, <clears throat> um, or you're not in and you're in a state that is not highlighted here, be sure to make sure and uh, be prepared to share that information and, and uh, log those sightings. All right, here is our bonus ant, uh, the bonus pest that I promised you all here, and that is the Asian needle ant. We're going to close out with this one really briefly. We're not going to spend a ton of time on it, but it is a relatively new invasive ant species to the state of Indiana, um, and it is one that has been in the United States here for a little while. Uh, we can see here the states that is currently confirmed in uh, as being established. We've also got a couple states, New York, Kentucky, and Tennessee, where it has been reported, but I do not believe it has been confirmed as being established in yet, uh, which is slightly different. Um, but 
It was confirmed in Indiana in spring 2022. And this picture here shows you clearly why it is a pest of importance. It packs a pretty powerful sting, very similar to that of the red imported fire ant. And unfortunately, much like the red imported fire ant has the ability to also uh, for those that are allergic, that may be sensitive to uh, stings like this, um, those that uh, at risk for anaphylaxis, uh, this ant could have that same effect on folks. Um, so uh, pretty concerning uh, from folks that may be or are allergic to insect stings. <clears throat> Certainly something that folks are pretty aware of, not to mention the, uh, the risk to, to native species that could be displaced from it. Um, it's a little bit larger of an ant species. So the um, the Argentinian we talked about earlier, two to three millimeters. This is four to five. They tend to be a little bit longer bodied ant. They do have that one node, but look how much bigger that node is. It protrudes much farther out above. <clears throat> they are a much darker brown um, ant with a uh, lighter orange legs. So they do contrast quite a bit compared to Argentine ants, but they are commonly associated with um, as uh, being similar in appearance to Argentine ants. Uh, but they are larger than Argentine ants. They are larger than others house ants. So if you see something that looks similar, but much larger than what they're used to, bag those things up, all right? Um, so habitat, they tend to be uh, prefer a more uh, moist, undisturbed area. That's going to be things like rotting logs, leaf litter under rocks, leaf soil, um, they will colonize undisturbed wooded areas, which is a little bit different. We typically see some of these ant species like the Argentine ant. They tend to prefer these recently displaced um, urban environments to kind of move into. Whereas these Asian needle ants will, will, will make themselves right at home in these undisturbed wooded areas. <laughs> Colonies can be polydomus and polygynous, like we mentioned earlier. Multiple queens, multiple sites can be pretty large, up to thousands of workers. Uh, and that one node that is visible from above. They will scavenge on quite a bit of different arthropods and other things. So they do have a high affinity for proteins. I will tell you that there's really no formalized control program out yet, uh, specifically designed for Asian needle ants. Um, but uh, the, the, so the, the recommendation here is to focus on protein-based baits. They tend to respond pretty well to those. Um, but they do have workers that will also readily feed on carbohydrate-based baits, which tend to be those clear sugar-based baits. Um, so the recommendation is to be sure you, you conduct some sort of test baiting process. Put a sugar out, put a protein out, see which ones they prefer, and then use that bait that they are feeding on. All right, in closing, how do we stop the unstoppable? Introductions are absolutely inevitable. They're going to keep happening. So is there hope? Absolutely. And the hope in a lot of cases is you. All right. Um, you are the frontline defenders. You do have the ability to you're out in the field regularly. Uh, you have eyes on the ground. You know what is normal and what is not. You don't need to be an expert at every living organism that survives in your area and anything around the world and be able to identify it. But you should be able to spot something that is abnormal. And there is no such thing as crying wolf in the world of invasive species reporting. If you see something that you think does not look right, take it to your local extension office, identify it, bag it up, put it in some alcohol, bring it to those folks. They would much rather see a thousand things that are misreported than miss that one thing that should have been reported. I promise you that it is very important. So you don't need to be an expert in everything. Just be able to know what is normal and what is not and keep that collection equipment with you at all times so you are always ready. Um, all right, so our take home message here, just to reiterate, and there's a lot of reasons as to why invasive species have uh, spread around the world. We are a big proponent, we're a big reason for that. Um, but certainly, you know, that the, with the ever changing world that's around us, invasive species introductions are inevitable. They will keep happening. And more of the world, if we continue on the warming trend, will be more habitable to these invasive uh, pests. So, be on the lookout, know your natives, be prepared to take pictures, collect samples, report them to your local department of ag and extension offices so that you can continue to help protect food, property, and public health um, against local and invasive species. All right, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close it out now. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for sitting through this long talk. Again, my name is Mike Bentley. If you have any questions about anything I talked about or questions about things that I did not talk about, I encourage you to reach out to me. That is my email. That is my phone number here. 
Um, and then we've got some online training resources. If you're looking for more training about the stuff that I cover today, I encourage you to reach out there. Thanks. And I hope to see you soon. Take care.